Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to uh, our uh, Dia Mundial de Poesia, World Poetry Day, as uh, we have a second session here, part of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, that's PBBI from California State University at Fresno. We have a wonderful group of poets uh, from various parts of the United States joining us uh, this evening. And uh, just uh, like those of you who joined us at noontime, we will be having uh, the readings uh, bilingual. So we will have presentations in um, Portuguese and in English. Most of them will be in English with about uh, three presentations in Portuguese. The two languages of our community mostly, and it's probably uh, pretty even the way um, uh, the reality kind of uh, sets in now, or, or that is, uh, we now have basically about uh, uh, 30% of the Portuguese Americans speaking uh, Portuguese and about 70% no longer, of course, if you are a first, second, third, and even fourth, in some cases, fifth generation, less and less Portuguese is spoken. Uh, so we're happy to have you here. We're happy to have everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to these awesome poets from different parts of the country, all American poets with roots in Portugal, many with roots in a particular part of Portugal, the Azores or the archipelago of Madeira as well, and some in mainland Portugal as well. So we have a variety from different parts of the country and also with different backgrounds. Um, once again, it is, of course, uh, World Poetry Day, and uh, we're very happy that uh, you uh, agreed to be uh, part of this uh, panel of this uh, poetry reading slam. Um, as uh, all of you know, uh, the uh, thanks to all of you who are joining us on social media outlets or here on Zoom. And the event, of course, is recorded for our Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute oral history collection at California State University, Fresno. So it was um, it's every year on the 21st of March that we have World yeah. Poetry Day to celebrate one of humanity's most treasured forms of cultural and linguistic expression and identity practiced throughout history in every culture and on every continent. Poetry speaks to our common humanity and our shared values, transforming the simplest of poems into a powerful catalyst for dialogue and peace. As you know, the United Nations UNESCO adopted the March 21st as World Poetry Day uh, during its 30th General Conference, which was held in Paris in 1999. So it has been uh, 23 years now. And in order to support linguistic diversity, is through poetic expression and increasing the opportunity for endangered languages to be heard. World Poetry Day, and I quote, is the occasion to honor poets, revive oral traditions of poetry recitals, promote the reading, writing, and teaching of poetry, foster the convergence between poetry and other arts, such as theater, dance, music, and painting, and raise the visibility of uh, poetry in the media, and as I said at noon, indeed, if we had more poetry and less reporting about uh, other things in the media, we might have a much better world, as we all know. And so as poetry really continues to bring people together across continents, and um, we, as we all aspire to a better world and a more peaceful world, and uh, we are much, much better off with folks like you, who are uh, os cultivadores da palavra, as we say it in Portuguese. So um, we're going to uh, start this. Uh, the, the order I have chosen is basically kind of a reverse alphabetical and uh, not to have one first, first, one second, one third. Uh, it's always something when I have a panel of about uh, nine or 10 people, who goes first and who doesn't. And so reverse alphabetical, but in a Portuguese style with a Portuguese first name. And uh, we will mix in those who are doing in Portuguese. So we have a few, uh, about three or four in English and then one in Portuguese. So we're going to start with um, Sue. And uh, if you'll just basically introduce yourself and, uh, and read your poems. We asked everyone for two poems. Again, thank you all very, very much. And welcome, Sue. Nice to see you as always. Thank you. I was in a panic because I didn't have the right link. But uh, uh, yeah. here, um, I... <laughs> I'm one of those people for whom the generations have passed and I don't have the Portuguese language except for a few words. Um, I wish I did. My great grandmother and grandfather came from Fayal and Pico and they didn't speak any English at all, but that's what happens. They settled in Santa Clara 
And I spent most of my life in San Jose, but now I live on the Oregon coast where Portuguese people are quite scarce. That's <laughs> <Indeed>. sad. <laughs> you know? So when I get back to the Bay Area and I start seeing Portuguese names, I'm like, yeah, yay. But anyway, so I have a short poem and a long poem to share with you today. You. At Five Wounds Church in San Jose, when the bent white bearded man sings the psalm at mass online, I feel my own father come to life. His voice is still strong. Despite slight wobbles, it reverberates off the stations of the cross and stirs the crocheted altar cloth. The teenager texting on her phone looks up, surprised. The old lady hidden in the white mantilla pauses in the counting of her rosary beads. Catholics watching on Facebook Live send heart emojis floating across the canter on their laptop screens. Together we sing the psalm refrain. Let all the earth cry out to God with joy, first in English, then in Portuguese. All right, this one is about my grandfather, Albert Avena, not Avena, who grew up in Gloucester, <laughs> Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, passed away too soon. St. Albert of Santa Clara. He wasn't a carpenter like Jesus's dad. His days were spent in the canning shed, the boards underfoot slick with juice, the air a cold cocktail of stinking fruit, leading the aproned women who cut the cots, sliced the peaches and sorted the prunes, who sent them down the conveyor belt to the men who sealed them in the cans. His name wasn't Joseph, but Albert. He spoke Portuguese, not Aramaic. His children weren't born in a manger. And he may never have seen an angel, this workman in flannel and long johns about whom we didn't know too much. No, Albert wasn't Jewish, Catholic. He joked that the roof would collapse if he dared to enter the church after years of dropping wife and kids at the door. Did he go back home and mow the lawn? Kick back with a beer in a giant's game? Did he park overlooking the Alviso Slough and remember his boyhood in Gloucester, his fisherman father who died at sea? the stepdad who moved them to California? Or did he just sit in the Chevy smoking his pipe, shaking his head at the ladies' feathered hats and the men in their stretched out Sunday suits? People called Albert a saint because he put up with Annie, his wife, who gossiped and complained and wanted. Quiet, he puffed on his pipe and did her bidding, tilling a new flower bed, building a shelf, or fetching linguisa to feed the family on Christmas Eve. Yes, dear, he'd say with a smile. Al never fled to Egypt, but he drove to San Diego once, only to learn, by telephone, not angels in a dream, that God had chosen his only son to suffer, not on a cross, but in a hospital bed, paralyzed, nailed to the scratchy sheets, asking, why has God forsaken me? Haggard, suddenly old, Al and Annie drove through the rainy winter night. She wailed at his side, my son, my son while he steered them through the storm and ran up the slippery hospital steps, gazed upon his son's familiar face and surrendered his life to care for him. In time, like Joseph, Albert silently fell ill and died. At his funeral, he finally re-entered the church. The steepled roof did not fall down. God had been saving him a place. St. Joseph reached out his hand. Come, my brother, welcome home. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sue. Wonderful. Um, although they're not in Portuguese, I think uh, they are very, very Portuguese. Um, okay. And thank you so much. And uh, from Sue, we will go to Paula. Paula Nevers, the way from the East Coast, I believe. Uh, uh, we've seen pictures of Paula at uh, different places uh, as she's done a, a bit of traveling and always mixing in the arts. And it's always, um, for those of you who follow Paula on social media, it is always an adventure and an artistic one at that. Welcome, Paula. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. It's, uh, you're always so very complimentary. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to read two poems. Uh, one's a little longer than the other. Um, the first one is not very Portuguese. There is a, a Portuguese word in it. Um, it's called Big Data. Alexa, I'm going to step out tonight and show off my big data. Alexa. Weren't you once a Billy Joel tune? An old school echo? Alexa, don't I look fly? Alexa, where is Echo, my 1990s six-toed cat, and that girl who was my first singularity, the first to enter my alma, 
which isn't the same as Psyche or Siri. She preferred echoes, said Kess, Bowie-eyed brother Boo, as in Radley, said we couldn't keep both, but they both stayed longer than her. Alexa, tell it to me. Aren't odd-eyed cats often deaf, but read love like lips? Alexa, can you read mine, soft as Ganymedes, mouthing love poems even from Mars? Alexa, will there be a time we can't keep cats, never mind house, in astronomical one bedrooms, flattened by gentrification, greed, or war, which are sort of the same? Alexa, does rent have two meanings? Alexa, in our future nouveau shelter in haunts with imported air, will you, dear mind reader, mind reader, call up our virtual booze, echoes, or bays and ask them what happened to us? Uh, the second one is a little bit more Portuguese. Um, so my, my parents uh, immigrated in the 1960s and they were very typical uh, Portuguese immigrants that you know, made us learn the language and kind of made us dress what we considered dorky uh, in the 70s and 80s. So uh, a favorite place for my mom to shop was Kmart, which I don't believe there's any Kmarts left across the country. Um, so I, I had a love-hate relationship with Kmart, um, especially when uh, big events at school came around like school picture day. So this one is called Kmart Pantsuits Picture Day. Velour sweater and polyester, school gym basement cafeteria, the yearly lensman said, smile, pretend that sour milk and memory aren't artifacts or money. And for, and for this, you left the compu dirt, let the factory break your back. Did you misunderstand what earth is? Why else buy me Kmart pantsuits so that everyone in school would know all the worlds you lost would not appear with cartoon certainty in every corner of our house. Yet for you, for this, I smiled like every day was picture day and Kmart would never close. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. I have the same feeling with Kmart. We have the same kind of parents. Uh, so, <laughs> indeed. Uh, uh, I've uh, had nightmares about that, always being different in school. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. Both of them. Uh, thank you so much, Paula. And from Paula, we uh, will go to, um, let's see here, uh, to Millicent. Uh, Millicent borges Riccardi. And Millicent, of course, as you all know, just published her book, which we've talked about here uh, before. And uh, congratulations, Millicent. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Okay. Um, this has nothing to do with my poems, but uh, Paula, uh, we were a Sears family, as you know, <laughs> but not just did we shop there, but my dad worked there for 35 years. So <laughs> this has nothing to do with my poems though. Um, I'm going to read two short ones, and they both sort of have in common yellow and blue. Because this one is broken. There was a boat, there were many boats, patterned after a fashion into a fleet. There were Portuguese widows who prayed, and those who sang of sailors and their strong sea amid the sky that we wore like a cape. There was a yellow radiance of sunset, and how it used to be. Please ask me, husband, and I will bring you a cup of vino verde. It is what is done when there are no answers. It is what we do and what we have always done. There is a storm gone blind against the curves of the land we fall into. Tears over the bow of a ship ashore, gone at sea for years. We wail and throw our hands against the blanched wood because that is what grief is a primary feeling that must be exposed, glow, storm, blind. Our men are an assault on we who wait for them as they travel to exotic lands, deciding not to return to a way of life that left them long before they unpack the dry bread in a cotton bag that we sent along with them on their blessed journeys. <clears throat> and the next one is uh, for Ukraine. Psalm six, I am worn out from groaning, people, mother, father, baby, child, toddler, student, woman, man, 
the grandmother who yells in Russian at the young soldier to tuck sunflowers in his front pocket, because when he dies, his body will sort out into new blooms on the land of Ukraine, that the yellow suns will redeem themselves, raking through shrapnel and Molotov cocktail remnants and disappear like cloth. The children's cancer ward bombed out at its corner seams with, teenager, with a teenager named Kira waiting for her Conyer parrot for three days in line to get into Poland. Those parents underground like sunflower seeds hiding from the nightly afraids and the implosions of fear they cannot show to their children as they clutch Lego backpacks to chests and look at the blue for signs of sky and look to the yellow for signs of wheat. We are kind, we are peaceful. We will feed you soldiers hot tea, the Kiev men say. We will help you to get home. Nightmare, slumber, boyhood, February, winter, imagining, omen, flying sleep. Thank you for including me in wow, that poetry. Very, <clears throat> very, very powerful, my friend. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Millicent Borzikardi. Wonderful poems. And uh, from Millicent, thank you so much. And again, congratulations on your book. And those of you in the audience, if you have not uh, purchased a new book, you can get it at Amazon uh, or wherever you buy your books, local bookstores. We have lots of them here in the Fresno area. Uh, a couple of them still, not lots of them. We used to have lots of them. We have a couple still. Uh, and you can certainly get it uh, through them. And you can get it online anywhere as well. Again, Millicent's new book. And again, congratulations and thank you for the poems. And from Millicent, we're going to turn to the Portuguese language. Uh, our very first in Portuguese, João Martins. Um, so, uh, muito brevemente, real briefly, João is from uh, or lives in Newark, New Jersey. He's from mainland Portugal. Uh, João is a poet and a sculptor and um, has been a, uh, an icon and uh, organizing many, many different events as well uh, related to literature um, in, in, the, in Newark and in the New Jersey area. Portanto, é com muito gosto que de seguida passamos para a língua portuguesa e o nosso amigo, o poeta João Martins, escultor, poeta, homem das letras, homem, portanto, também da cultura, e que tem promovido imenso a cultura portuguesa no estado de New Jersey, na zona de Newark e, e toda a zona, portanto, circunvizinha. João, bem-vindo, estás em mute, portanto, tens que ligar o teu som, se fazes favor, para a gente te ouvir, por favor. É aí num botãozinho no lado esquerdo, salvo erro. Como convém sempre à esquerda. Acho ah, já estamos, estás. Já acho estás. Que estamos agora. Feito. Ok. Estas tecnologias ainda às vezes não. não essas, 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 essas esculturas são tuas aí? São minhas, são do meu pai. São. So all the... All of the sculptures in the background are either his or his, or his não, father. Não mostra as outras, senão vocês assustam-se e fogem. Tá, não, não, não se assustam. <laughs> uh, do, de um livro, de um dos meus últimos livros de 2015, uh, Quando Menino Eu Lia. Quando Menino Eu Lia. Quando menino, eu lia livros de menino, com palavras de menino, com histórias de menino. Quando era menino, tinha pressa de andar, de correr, de aprender a ler e fazer muitas outras coisas reservadas aos grandes. De sonho em sonho, ia avançando passo pequenino, passo grande, tanto como a idade que nunca mais chegava. Lia nas linhas minúsculas, Pequenas letras, maiúsculas eram letras de palavras de crescidos, letras dos grandes aos olhos do menino. Li às escondidas os livros que devorava na biblioteca de todas as, que todas as semanas esperava por mim, itinerante, na praça da vila e das aldeias. Lia, lia, lia e mais queria as histórias de menino ou de meninos que a poesia ainda não a conhecia dos versos que mais tarde guardaria nos bolsos da memória e recitava ainda sem saber que era possível escrever de forma diferente e somava livros, ambições, palavras difíceis, 
refeições de prazer e de escrita, como no, no postal dos seis anos que enviei lá de longe da praia. Já na escola, conheceria outros livros, as primeiras moedas e jogos de cartas, os mapas e as cartas, o primeiro fumo aspirado fora da lareira no secretismo de quem joga às escondidas à sorte e aposta no futuro por jogar. Já então, sem o saber, era carente das cartas adivinhadas, as respostas inventadas, as conversas escutadas sem telefone ou ecos de distância entre o desassossego e o sujo dos calções e do mundo cão, lá fora, à minha volta, a rodar invisível nos livros. Uh, tinha aqui uma outra escolha, <risos> tinha aqui uma outra escolha, mas dada esta a, mal, a riqueza da amálgama que nos junta aqui, uh, se diz mudar de, 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 de objetivo e suponho que este poema já foi até publicado há uns anos na, na antologia que também foi coordenada pelo Luís Gonçalves e pelo Carlos Matos a antologia dos poetas portugueses, e que, tem, e que tento refletir exatamente esta miscelânea do vir de Portugal sem falar inglês, aqui os filhos aprendem o inglês, mas não falam português e querem aprender a, a, falar, a falar o português também. Na tradução, saiu com o título, na tradução em inglês, Broken English, a, na versão original, em português, chama-se Polifonia de Sonhos Intactos. Pode ser partida a minha fala. Mantenho sonhos intactos. Sempre, ou quase sempre, excetuando breves momentos de dúvida e dores. Se bem que os sonhos podem ser sonhados em qualquer linguagem, torna-se mais fácil sonhar nas palavras que aprendi com o leite e com os sonhos maternos. São tão universais como o coração. E com o devido respeito pelas singularidades desta e daqueles, quando escutamos na rua o linguarejar e os adivinhamos no rosto dos passantes da rua que todos os sonhos, nessa rua que também é casa. Em casa, sonhávamos e falávamos em polifonia. Na minha linguagem de verso, ensinava aos meus filhos e daí dependiam os laços com o longe e o tempo. E na linguagem deles eu aprendia as novas cores dos sonhos. E de palavra em palavra, de sonho em sonho, e nos verbos do coração, em vez de laços quebrados, tínhamos, laço, tínhamos braços ligados. Desde o tempo em que os sentimentos nos ficaram das raízes de outros tempos, e os sonhos ligaram as raízes aos frutos. Uh, eu penso que o Carlos possivelmente lembrará. E já agora, ligado neste poema, muito, uma, muito, dois versos muito simples. Cantilena, de mãe para mãe, para mãe e filha, cantigas do coração, do leite e do corpo. Muito bem, João. Muito obrigado, como sempre, mestre nas palavras, mestre na emoção, mestre na escultura também. Uh, and for those of you uh, who don't, of course, understand Portuguese, uh, very emotional and two, two great poems, a uh, third one here as well. And uh, João brought something that uh, my generation and his generation remembers well in Portugal, being raised in Portugal, those of us who like to read, and I think José Raposo as well, which was the uh, Bibliotecas de Gulbenkian, you know, a Biblioteca Itinerante. They had these little carts that would go from village to village. By the way, the city of Angra do Ruismo and the library in Angra do Ruismo in Terceira has brought that back. They call it Tasca dos Livros, which I love the name because a Tasca is where you go to get, uh, it's the, 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 what's like a food cart, you know, at, the, at, uh, at uh, various places that it's called. So uh, there is now something that was very popular in the 1950s and 60s and 70s in Portugal, which was the, 
the a bibliothek itinerant the Golbenkin, and they would go from Fregazia to Fregazia, from village to village. Um, and uh, to my to my area, they would come like every two weeks, and uh, we were able to get so we were to check out three or four books, and then two weeks later we would check out another three or four books. It was great, um, and um, and now the same thing is happening thanks to the library in Angra, and I think it's being followed in some areas also in mainland Portugal, and it's called Tasca dos Livros, uh, uh, the same kind of concept. And so from uh, João, we will go uh, to Lynette, Lynette Escobar here from California. So we're moving from the East Coast to the West Coast. And uh, Lynette, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I have to go after the icon, I see. <laughs> no, you're an icon. we're all icons. Yes. Everyone, everyone here is an icon, okay? <laughs> Great. It's just as we become older, the icons <laughs> may be different. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I think like other people, I, I thought, oh, I need to read a, a Portuguese poem. And it's like, aren't all my poems Portuguese, Portuguese American, actually. But I did choose one of my Portuguese poems from, oh, it's all blurred. It's the book that you just read from, João um that carlo um oh look look we're all lots of us are on it so this is really beautiful to be with with all these colleagues um this, this one is this is my portuguese poem it, you know there's always an avó so legacy avó lisa pounds together blue corn and gray fava beans into a warm mush she makes just for me I remember her doing this long before my brothers were born, before my grandfather died. She always carried this strength, belting out hymns like Ave Maria for her silver friends. Elisa, they say, you sing so beautiful. It makes her smile, a secret smile, the smile she probably gave my grandfather at 13. Smile of the little girl becoming engaged smile of the lady who wishes she could read. Years ago, we went to bingo every third Sunday. All the ladies smelled like white bath powder, jean and a tay in a round paper box. Mrs. Silva, Mrs. Rosario, Mrs. Ponte, they all brought zucchini bread. All let me close the free space for them. Sometimes I went doilies for, or crochet slippers. Avoa would tell me to save them from my hope chest. Then my hope was deeper than her basement filled with wooden barrels of grandfather's vingo and yellowed calendars of army girls. Today, Avoa's house is quiet like her smile when she doesn't understand the lady at the store and asks me to tell her in Portuguese. The house quiet and lonely like the wax that drips slowly down a burning red votive candle in a Catholic church. They used to tell me it meant God was there, that candle. So I worried all through mass that it would blow out. I feel that way sometimes still in the glow of a Voiliza's shadow, watching her knit in my grandfather's old Chez recliner she knits together oceans that are all red and green and gold, knits together the voices of my great grandmothers and children who never wore bandages, no matter what country they were calling home. And then I'll go non-Portuguese, which you'll see is Portuguese. <clears throat> this is Bay Area. I love kisses of elderflower in my vodka takes the girl out of the bridge, out of the tunnel, firmly into the tongue of the city. I read my heart in a sing-song voice to strangers, say sorry to the homeless as I avoid their eyes. I apply to artist residencies in Brazil and debate Syrian intervention with Zionists. If I ever drank the original flavor Bartel and James wine cooler, I will deny it on Muni buses filled with people wearing skinny jeans. I will throw away the baseball hat you gave me 
and forget the dirt roads that ended with you and me in the back seat of the 1967 Dodge Dart. If I called it love, I didn't know. Hadn't heard an opera, danced in a warehouse, tried caviar. I hated the caviar. And you, the hole in the wall from where my father threw the cup, the gopher heads my avu cut with a machete, that long stretch on Mission Boulevard where men would slow their cars to yell at me, that boy Peter who grabbed my breast and laughed, that summer when I thought the night stalker was coming to kill me, that hospital that keeps my brother, that hospital where Uncle Johnny had four amputations, you will stay in Hayward and I will live in the city drinking the essence of flowers. Thank you. Magnificent. Thank you so much. Both right. wonderful right. poems. Thank you so much. <laughs> Very well done. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. And from Lynette, uh, we will go back to the East Coast and uh, Logan Duarte from Massachusetts. Logan, of course, as all of you know, has uh, been uh, writing and publishing poetry, and uh, he is a Portuguese language teacher as well, and has uh, many ties to the Portuguese American world. Um, uh, Logan, thank you so much for taking time. I know it's a busy time uh, at teaching. Uh, you're almost at, at spring break, and that's always a good thing. Uh, uh, again, thank you and welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's such an honor to be here, honestly. So um, the two poems I have today are both along a theme that is very near and dear to the hearts of not only me living here on the East Coast, but also Azorians as a whole, which is the sea. In the folds of dark sea, or Jangada. In the folds of dark sea, sea fowls gather in rafts, rafts not bound by boards nor wound in string but built by wings and wings, waiting patiently for the time when nature completes its cycle. When the folds of flocking fowls and flopping fish collide in the dark shadows cast by a setting sun on a meandrous sea. In the folds of dark sea, sea fowls sing in their cages, cages with no walls to confine nor wire to withhold cages where the cluster of kagahu cacophony freely mingles with bottlenose whistles and folds with the slow rising crescendo of open ocean swells. Bowed backward points glide across the thin dark surface before long yellow spears swiftly plunge and pierce, giving life to death and nourishment to sacrifice. And this second one here, I should also mention is inspired by a oil on linen painting by a extremely talented young up and coming Portuguese American painter, also from this area of Southeastern Massachusetts. I believe the last time I read the poem, I didn't mention his name. So I want to make a point to mention his name. It is Jonathan Garcia and his family is from the island of Santa Maria. This is titled Into the Fog. Fishy hands on rusted cleats, weathered eyes from a weathered vessel fixed firmly astern on a growingly distant New Bedford port. Metal moves metal and hums a tune only a fisherman may fancy as melody. At port bow, Butler Flats offers a friendly smile and a sense of direction through the morning mist. Through broom that blends with salty squalls, she kisses the vessel and its crew with her light, wishing them fortune and a safe way bound. A kiss, like the one Salacia so often gave to their exposed fingers and to their bones despite the burliness of their bibs. A kiss, like the one they gave their daughters this morning who still dream with dry sheets and fluffed pillows. Two crewmates stand astern watching waves become wake. Their arms tucked into their overalls, their fingers hugging their thumbs. Outward bound and underway, they face the fog, head straight for it. They laugh at the safety of solid ground 
and puff their chests to the songs of sirens because metal still moves metal, still hums its tune and the sailors sing of home. Fantastic as always, Logan. Thank you so much. Two wonderful poems. Appreciate it. Thank you. And from Logan, we'll come back to uh, the California again, and this time, uh, and switched over to Portuguese and uh, José Raposo uh, from uh, Marin County, from uh, Northern uh, California, north of the of San Francisco. Sometimes when we talk about the uh, California, we say uh, San Francisco is north, but there's a, there's there's another few hours. Uh, from San Francisco to Oregon, and there's uh, uh, a whole another state almost, uh, which, and uh, we're happy to have José. José has been publishing poetry in uh, Portuguese and in English as well, um, and he's going to read uh, a couple of poems in Portuguese for us, I believe. Portanto, José Raposo, bem-vindo, meu caro amigo, com muito gosto, como sempre, e, uh, portanto, é com muito gosto uh, que uh, o temos aqui conosco. Obrigado por mais uma vez teres aceito o nosso convite. Obrigado, Nês, e obrigado a todos. Estou contente por ver algumas caras conhecidas que já não vejo há muitos anos, como a Su. A Su, ali, oh my God, uh, 20 years, maybe? You were both babies, ok. <laughs> um, I didn't prepare any poems, so I had a bunch of poems here, in the, uh, a few folders that I just grabbed them. Open, open up, then grab them. And I have one here in Portuguese called Parasitas. Se tu me estás escutando, ó oh Camões, atenção, eu te peço, meu herói. Traz ao mundo outras armas e barões, independentemente se há alguém dói. Reescreve esta epopeia de cabrões, capivaras, castores, que é mais rói. O cerne da madeira que constrói portas, camas, janelas e portões, insectos diabólicos destruíram, Hoje em dia, o que muitos construíram. The one in English, again, I just picked one. I don't know, to whom I wrote it and when. And it's titled Single Mom. Single Mom. Don't show the world the sadness of your eyes but let it see the beauty and kindness of your heart. Cry in the silence of the night. Tell your lonely pillow the frustration and the anger you may feel. Don't show the world your tears. It does not care. It will not understand. Come out in the morning and breathe the sunshine. Be strong and march to the sound of the heartbeat of your son or your daughter. Follow the ruffle of the drums and the sounds of the trumpets stand high against any birds of prey or any vulture ready to feast. You are not dead yet. Brandish the sword of love and polish the shield of honor. You have a battle to win, a mission to complete. And as the sun sets on the horizon, you will savor the taste of victory. Muito obrigado, José. Muito obrigado. Uh, uh, José uh, Raposo also uh, publishes a, a bi-weekly column uh, or twice a month a bi-monthly column on the um, Portuguese Tribune. He has been doing that for many, many years and has been in, involved in many aspects of the Portuguese American community and has published quite a few books, I believe, what seven. you say? Seven. Yeah, I was going to say seven or eight different books and has much poetry that has not been published that needs to be published as well. So we need to work on another book for him. Thank you, José. And from José, we're going Welcome. to go to Diana, Diana Ramos of Firestone. Hi, everybody. Um, so as you know, I tend to focus on the intersection of what it means to be Portuguese and Portuguese American. So a lot of my work tends to be around that. Um, so these are two that I, same as, 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 as José there, I just kind of pulled two out this morning um, and these felt right today. So this one, this first one is called Immigration Tuesday at the Masonic Center. Uh, so Immigration Tuesday at the Masonic Center. The stone building offered nothing that I would come to this country for. But every Tuesday, thousands flow into the Masonic Center waiting to be led to something better. What's wrong with Portugal? I asked my dad. It's just not home anymore. As we climbed the steps into this building, solicitors waved voting papers in our faces. 
I took one and threw it away. While waiting for the ceremony to begin, I stepped outside. I was met by a man selling placards for everyone's certificates. I bought one just so he would leave me alone. I turned into the building for the last time that day and waited for the show to begin. I saw eager eyes ready to promise themselves to America with little flags waving in the air. They stood below their families in the balcony and swore to defend our country, to protect our laws, most of them looking at each other rather blankly. Their mouths moving awkwardly, like, almost like puppets, open, close, open, close. Lips always parted, their eyebrows always pointed up. After the oath, we walked outside and stood still on the steps of the building and filled out his voting card. I had to read most of it to him, but like everyone else, he wanted to belong here. On our way back to the ferry building, everyone was holding their certificates with both their hands. I reached into my bag and gave my dad his placard so he could keep his paper safe. And this other one, also about my dad, I guess I'm in my, my, my dad's in my head today. So uh, this one is called Bad Boys. Uh, and this is uh, after my, one of the first times my husband met my dad <laughs> and vice versa. Um, and some mistakes that we make along the way. So it's called Bad Boys. Bad Boys bring flowers. He said to me after seeing his only daughter glowing with a single red camellia flower squeezed between her fingers. What did he do? Not up I let it go, he's a good guy. Boys bring flowers to say sorry, that's it. He said grunting under his breath. He don't even speak Portuguese. What kind of man is that? Are you gonna let him over or not pie? Ugh, talk to your mom. Two months later, Ben and I go over to my parents' house for dinner. My mom has just finished yelling at my dad for letting the dog loose again. As we enter the kitchen to sit down together, she stops talking and smiles at the center of the table. Not just one flower was decorating it, but an entire hand-picked garden in a vase. My dad tries to avoid my smirk. He grins and laughs it off, then kisses my mom's cheek. Maybe next time he'll remember to leave the dog inside. Thanks. Wonderful, wonderful poems, both of them. Yes, indeed. And as people are commenting, they have very some great lines there, obviously. Um, and from uh, from Diana, thank you so much. And again, congratulations, Diana. She has uh, a poem and a book that was just uh, published by a photographer. Who's been who's not Portuguese <laughs> and who's done a wonderful job in collecting uh, the history of the Portuguese festa. She's been taking uh, photographs from a different perspective, not what you normally would see, because he's not Portuguese. I said he's his wife actually is Portuguese, and um, we've just discovered his wife did a master's thesis on the role of identity in the Portuguese festa. She never published, which we really need to work on. But um, so he went along to, as she was doing her master's thesis, she wanted a couple of pictures. And he went along to take pictures and he fell in love with the festers. And for 32 years, he's been taking pictures of festers. And he published a wonderful book uh, of photography and includes a few poems and one of them and a poem by Diana. So congratulations and thank you. And uh, um, from Diana, we will go to uh, Carlo Matus. And uh, Carlo, uh, we've been talking about that uh, that uh, a new anthology. It's been it's been used and, and used here in uh, many different aspects. And uh, maybe we can start working on something that we can publish it out here for Bruma Publications at Fresno State. If we all can work together on that, it sounds good. I'm feeling the pressure. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, of course, everyone knows Carlo uh, just uh, came out with two books in the last few months. I just received my copy. It's over there. I was going to reach for it, but then I didn't want to be rude and get up in the middle of a poem. Uh, but uh, I will start reading uh, t tomorrow. And of course, his, we, uh, the, his, his poetry book that just came out a few months ago and that we had a wonderful conversation on the Portuguese American Hour with Carlo about it. Uh, uh, produces great work, as all of you know, as I, and as all of you do. Carlo Matos. Thank you, Denise. So kind of you, as always. Uh, really appreciate that you bought Ashmar Kriadaj as well. Um, so uh, you said festers, and my feet started to hurt because I played a lot of Prusisange and festers, fourth grade all the way to junior year, okay? And in cheap shoes. It was brutal. I need to write about that. Okay, thank you. That's an idea. Was that a right. Walmart, was it, was it Kmart shoes as well? Oh, or, they were Kmart Sears. shoes. Yeah, <laughs> made of plastic. They would like cook in the sun. <laughs> Yikes. Okay. Um, I'm going to read just two poems from my collection, We Prefer the Dan. Uh, go with some um, some sea imagery or map making. I think that that'll do as a connection. Cartography. There is distance now between the lover's actions and what motivates those actions. 
the result of futile attempts to return to an earlier diffident state, ambiguous loss, the psychologists call it. All that had once been natural becomes defibrillation, fills with resolution and purpose, but is in no sense pleasurable. Even if his outward displays appear similar, the impulses behind them are not. He dreams of being murdered in my sleep, of extinction, I of ragged sails, failing, miscarrying, blowing kisses in the wind to my pirate ancestors. He remembers folding an atlas once in his father's car, recalls being cartographed like a city map. This part, the Tagus, another, the Braga Bridge, this, the Hancock Tower. How tedious and ancient to always see in pieces to be mad in love with the synecdotal and the metonymic. I admit to getting lost in mirrors, turning without fail in the wrong direction like a shift into second person. Recall that you are largely rhetorical anyway, having evolved to where being used and being useful has little distinction, like that little reflection in your diary, unfair, unkind, and unsure. Okay, and uh, this one is called spilling wind. Uh, spilling wind is a nautical um, term um, for your sails, not fully uh, gathering the wind or whatever. I don't know a lot about boats. But this, this is just what I, just because all of my family knows doesn't mean I, all right, spilling wind. It's true, I have not whispered the words, I love you, unguarded across a steering wheel to anyone new in over 21 years. We're heading south through cornfield, wind farms, blinking like buoys on the sea and right into the bosom of a midnight storm. It's our first road trip and we are barely out of Illinois when the rain blows us beneath an underpass with a soaked biker and her lady. There's a touch of country about them, about you, just a lilt at the ends of words. Mm -hmm just a lilt spilling wind from their lips, from your lips, luring me onto pursuit before the cannons fire. I am partial to nautical metaphors, having lived my whole life by the sea, my family, islanders, hundreds of years, I don't know. Whereas you prefer similes as honest as dirt when worked properly. It may have been the wrong time to tell you I had jumped like a drowning man from my mother's moving car when I was 13. There are so many ways to die, stupidity, the only one to really fear. And you seemed unsure now if my hand was reaching for the door handle or the cannon's lanyard, reaching toward the country beneath you or away into the rising water below the underpass. Thank you. Magnificent as always. Thank you so much, Carlo. Thank you. It's a wonderful book, um, and uh, thank you for, uh, for 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 also taking time again from your busy schedule to be here as we commemorate uh, World Poetry Day with a with a Portuguese American flair. And thank you so much for your powerful uh, poetry. And um, last but certainly not least, and uh, actually it kind of worked because uh, she had a teaching uh, commitment until not too long ago, but she did make it uh, just as we were beginning. And so uh, Amy uh, Bautista, and uh, I love that she has the P still in the name. That's the way we spell it in Portuguese. The P is <laughs> gone away in, in Bautista. The P is going away in everything in Portuguese yeah. and in Altimu and everything else. But uh, Amy still has her name as Bautista has been uh, for uh, generations in the Portuguese <laughs> language. Amy, uh, thank you so much. Very wonderful. Uh, nice to see you uh, as always. And uh, uh, last time you were here was with, of course, the Kale Soup uh, reading group that we had. And it was uh, you were hit uh, by many, many people here at Fresno State. They had not heard of you before and fell in love with your poetry. And again, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. I'm so grateful. Oh, my goodness. Um, all right. Well, I, I think I'll read first a, um, a pandemic poem. Um, I've pondered a lot as the pandemic I hope is slowing down all the effects that it has had. So this is called, maybe some of you can relate to this a little bit in some places. Maybe you'll wear the same clothes as yesterday and no one will notice. 
This is a good outfit, stylish, fits in, yet says individual, grown up, but youthful. You might wear it again and again. Why not wear it, but stop drinking? Why not wear the same thing and burn Facebook? Except it's not a real book, so delete it and imagine the ash and stink. Imagine, what if you read books everyone else is reading? That's real, but good, and words between friends make connections. You could even write words in this outfit. Small words written consistently become small books. The same clothes may not win you any prizes or put you on the top of the top 10 lists, but you will win smaller awards, be known in smaller circles. And anyway, people love you there. What good is winning without a good outfit? This one shows your length, slim lines, colors that complement. This is not an outfit inspiring hate mail or internet bullying. You don't want that. No one takes time to cut tiny letters from newspapers, glue them to paper and rage, rage for this outfit. Most people can't even find their scissors today. This outfit does not arrive enthusiastic, overstuffed, marked postage due. The postman doesn't even come this week. You could wear this outfit to work if you had a job. You could wear it to mass. It will hold faith between the last button and the frayed hemline. This look says transparency. You're not holding anything back at all except honesty. Truth is not trending. You can wear this outfit with confidence, knowing no one knows you at all, that no one will notice you at all, not notice that you're talking, just open and close your mouth, Charlie McCarthy style. Now nod, laughing comforts most people, as do pastels. This outfit is perfect, except lose the last 10 pounds you have wanted to so badly part with and stop being mad at your father. Call your mother more often, and you would not need Xanax to combat nightfall. You could sleep in this outfit for eight hours straight, or the rest of your life, or right up until the moment you put a gun in your mouth. Try the orange and gold sandals if you want to shake it up, but leave the rest the same. Do that and take the CTA instead of driving, or better, walk. Keep walking past the place you expect yourself to stop. Walk until you fall asleep on your own fatigue. Walk past the cemetery of dead iPhones, cracked screen bones protruding. Remember when friends had whole conversations without ever looking at their hands, never checking to see if they still matter to people they don't really care about. Remember Plato? This outfit will not help you solve those problems or any problems or remember those times, for that, you would have to change. Great. Thank you. And I'll read one short poem from Carlo's book. I call it Carlo's book. Uh -huh. <laughs> and Luis, oh, we all, Luis. We all, we all call it Carlo and Luis's book. <laughs> Luis, you would be so aggravated at me for not saying his name first. Luis and Carlo, okay. And this is a Portuguese poem by way of Appalachia, which is uh, the way of my people. The fisherman's daughter learns to fly. Daddy says, you don't kill it lest you use it all. He says, salt and brains are the most important ingredients. Preserving a deer's hide must be done correctly or skin rots on the frame like memory. Daddy and I stretch carcass over plywood. I hand him nails and hold the hammer. All that remains must be scraped away. We are gods working in reverse, unmaking the creature bathed last night in moon glow, a leap as silent as rain. I am 10 and want to forget the inside smell of a deer. He says, stop crying or go back to the house. I want to tip the pan of brains back into the empty skull, unskin the legs as delicate as kindling wood, and refire the heart. You hear me? 
a nod yes. A crow swoops, grabs a string of gut, and my soul reaches out for escape. Daddy puts a knife in my hand and pushes down hard on the hide. I scrape away the gore and he pulls the wind from my mouth, saying nothing but teaching that salt is meant to swallow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, a wonderful poem. I've read it and reread it a couple of times uh, so, and always get something out of it. Uh, appreciate it very, very much, Amy. And thank you for your uh, the pandemic poem, which is uh, beyond awesome. Um, thank you all. Um, on behalf of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute at California State University, Fresno, thank you so much for taking uh, this little over an hour to uh, commemorate World Poetry Day, Dia Mundial de Poesia. Uh, thanks to for your for, for your work. Um, please continue writing poetry. You all do it very very well, and uh, I believe the world is a much much better place uh, because of the poetry that all of you write. Uh, so take take care, stay safe, and uh, happy World Poetry Day to all of you. And again. Uh, my thanks to all of you for taking the time to be with the Fresno State and PBBI at Fresno State. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Good night. Boa noite. Muito obrigado. Boa noite para todos. Muito obrigado. Boa noite. Boa noite. Obrigado.